Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Uh, we heard uh, a great message uh, last night uh, from, from the bishop, uh, and uh, hopefully I can uh, add a little something to that. Uh, I am here just to talk about the medical aspect of isolation, violence, hope, and communion. Uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, on this. Uh, Is that better? Can you hear me okay? In the back. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. <clears throat> so we've uh, spent quite a bit of time on this, uh, on this problem. As a trauma surgeon uh, in a busy uh, metropolitan trauma center, where we take care of uh, 7,000 injured uh, patients uh, a year uh, between myself and my uh, 10 partners. Uh, it, it, we, we live, eat, and breathe violence. Uh, it, is a, it, it is a terrible uh, problem, a scourge uh, on uh, mankind, and uh, uh, we, we, we really would like to do something about it. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the past on uh, trying to prevent people from getting injured, uh, we've influenced the automobile industry uh, starting in the 1960s, uh, car seats and you know, fall prevention, all sorts of things. Uh, this violence thing has a life of its own, and uh, we're trying to come to understand it. Uh, while I have no disclosures to make, I will tell you that I am a life member of the uh, National Rifle Association, uh, and that uh, I am a gun owner and enthusiast. Uh, that has uh, th maybe uh, some influence in uh, uh, this presentation today uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, what I'm going to talk about and, pro and provide uh, today is the American College of Surgeons' viewpoint uh, on a public health uh, uh, solution, potentially, some, we, we have more questions than answers, on uh, firearm injury prevention. This is just one aspect of violence, uh, but perhaps the most lethal uh, of those things. And uh, the impulsivity uh, that comes uh, with uh, suicide related to firearms uh, is a huge uh, problem in this, uh, in this country. So we're going to review some things, we're going to lay some groundwork, I'm going to give you some personal examples, uh, and then I'm going to tell you what uh, a, a group of hundreds of surgeons uh, thinks about this. And these are the people that care for uh, these injured victims on a day in and day out basis. Uh, the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma is nearly 100 years old. Uh, and uh, uh, there are regions uh, that are, are around the world uh, that uh, uh, total more than 3,500 members of this committee on trauma. Uh, we have an injury uh, prevention and control uh, committee, and I sat on the executive committee of the American College of Surgeons for about six years uh, and have been uh, a member of this firearm strategy team work group uh, to try to figure out uh, what we can do uh, to stem this tide. Uh, this is that uh, group of folks uh, that have uh, uh, worked on this uh, for, for a long time, just, just regular people from around the country uh, that uh, are very interested in having people not hurt themselves or hurt one another. Uh, we have a, a bevy of things that we have uh, uh, put together over time uh, to teach people how to care for the injured uh, as well as how to try to prevent injury. Uh, we, we oversee trauma centers around the country to make sure that the quality of care rendered uh, is appropriate uh, in those places. And we'll be joined tomorrow uh, by the uh, Chicago uh, uh, segment of the Committee on Trauma uh, for a special session at uh, uh, 10 o'clock on how to stop bleeding. Uh, what all of this requires is a very, it's a very uh, collegial environment. Uh, we listen to all uh, viewpoints, try to come to consensus uh, at, every, at every point, and we try to base that uh, as best as we can on available research and data. Uh, so this, this, this issue is a public health problem. 
as much as uh, the world would like to make this a, a, a political problem, it, it really shouldn't be. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, there, there, there's a ton of evidence uh, to support that you can change a problem if you apply your resources uh, uh, to it. Uh, but what this is going to require is that we talk with one another. And uh, I think His Grace uh, said this uh, last night in a way that uh, hit home with me, is that when you have a conflict uh, between your mind and your heart, you should put your mind in your heart uh, and uh, view the issues uh, from that perspective to set aside conflict. Uh, and so uh, this, th this comes from uh, John Bowman, uh, circa 1916, so over 100 years ago. Uh, from the American College of Surgeons, uh, where he felt that philosophers ruled the world uh, and that you have to choose, you have to find and express thoughtfully uh, the personal equation of your lives. Uh, I don't want to take care of another person who's been shot or has shot themselves. Uh, none of us want to, 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 to experience that. The fewer holes there are in people, the more lives that, 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 that will continue. Uh, and uh, that's at the core of what we believe about this problem. Uh, so we have dedicated ourselves to the service of, of, of humanity and we use science as best we can uh, to help us to, to do that. Uh, and so this is a, a, a different kind of uh, a philosophy uh, that comes uh, from this uh, book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, uh, that uh, facts are facts, but your interpretation of those facts and the way that you string them together and tell your story is just that. It, it, it's a story. And that uh, if you hold on to your story tightly, that, that leads to this conflict. You can't release that and you can't listen to another person's point of view. So you should hold on loosely uh, to, that, uh, 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 to that story and listen to what other people have to say uh, lest you learn something or change your mind. So there are two polarizing viewpoints on this issue that uh, uh, on one side of this equation, guns are a right, and it leads to personal protection, and it's paramount to our freedom. On the other side of this equation is that guns are equal to violence, and they actually limit our freedoms. And how do you find the common ground in the narrative uh, to keep people from harming themselves or one another? Uh, this is a huge uh, uh, a study in terms of uh, injury-related uh, uh, individuals belonging to two uh, major academic organizations in this country dealing with injury. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, uh, not quite half, but approaching half, uh, believe that firearm ownership is beneficial and the other equal part thinks that it's harmful. Uh, so even, so what I guess the, you know, the point is that the trauma community is e as equally divided uh, as it would seem uh, as uh, uh, the citizens are uh, uh, in our country. And over time, this disparity, this difference has grown larger, which does not make solving any problem easier uh, when you get further from common ground. So uh, violence is, is, a, is a problem, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a huge problem, especially when you take into account self-harm uh, and, and suicide. Uh, there's a lot of folks here who deal with this on a daily basis, uh, with uh, your, your patients, uh, those who you counsel, uh, those who you care for, uh, uh, those who you pray for and uh, uh, preventing injury uh, is uh, uh, paramount to what I do on a day-to-day on -day basis. 180 citizens of this country die every day related to intentional violence. Uh, about 70% of those are related to self-harm and about 30% are intentional harm against another individual. 
overall, nearly 40,000 citizens in this country die each year related to firearm injury violence when you total all of those things uh, uh, together. For every individual that dies, there are nine or ten other individuals who are admitted to a hospital with serious injuries uh, related to firearm injury violence. It is a terrible burden on this society and on each and every one of us uh, and the families of those uh, uh, individuals. Uh, when you look at all intentional injury uh, over time, this has uh, climbed, uh, whereas unintentional injury related to uh, something like motor vehicle crashes has declined. We've invested quite a bit in safer roads and safer vehicles and law enforcement, uh, et cetera, and this is evidence that you can solve a problem or at least make a big change in, that, in, the, in the degree uh, of that problem uh, when you put your resources uh, uh, to bear uh, on, that, uh, on that issue. Uh, and so when you look at uh, patients that we care for in trauma centers uh, around this country, uh, firearm injury is just a tiny little piece of these injured patients and the ones who die. Uh, but again, by lethality, it's equivalent to all those other things, even though the proportion is that small. Uh, and so this really gets our attention, uh, especially when we start to look at children and children involved in shootings. Uh, and so this is adults and children. You can see suicide numbers going up, homicide numbers going up uh, over the past uh, 10 years uh, uh, or so. Uh, and uh, in fact, when you look at car crash deaths of children dating back uh, to the uh, uh, late 1990s, uh, and those deaths in children related to firearm, uh, what you can see is that gap is rapidly closing. Uh, we have solved a problem with traffic-related deaths uh, between car seats and better engineering and airbags. Uh, we have not solved this problem uh, related to firearm uh, injury. And uh, what you can see is that uh, unlike motor vehicle crash deaths, which really affect uh, children the most in a rural uh, type of environment, a uh, firearm injury doesn't discriminate uh, by your location. Uh, and so that's, it, it, it is ubiquitous across all uh, aspects of our lives. Uh, dating back to the 1950s, uh, what you can see is that sadly, uh, we have now uh, reached a point where firearm uh, injury uh, related deaths uh, are surpassing motor vehicle crash uh, deaths uh, per uh, uh, population. So if intentional violence is, is, is the problem and we have 180 people dying every day, 60% uh, of whom uh, die related to firearm injury, uh, and that it's a major problem in both children and adults, and this is just one-tenth of the issue in terms of the overall burden of this disease process, uh, we have not kept pace with the things that we have done uh, in one small area in terms of uh, traffic-related deaths. So how can we solve this? Why would we solve it? And, and, and how would you go about it? And, and what would you need to do uh, to, to, to make a difference? So the why really comes down to the needless death and suffering of our patients, their families, our neighbors, those in our communities, uh, and, and it's, it, it's, again, ubiquitous across this country, across this globe. Uh, and it affects our patients, our colleagues, our friends, our coworkers, our communities, our neighborhoods. It affects our cities, our elected leaders, uh, uh, and uh, it, it's a huge problem. So I'm going to take you back, it's nearly two years to the day uh, that in a place not unlike this, just quite a bit warmer, 
so southeast of uh, San Antonio in the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs. Uh, there was a, a mass shooting during services uh, that uh, day. Uh, this is the trauma region that I come from and the partners that we have that work on solving uh, 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 injury-related problems, responding to events that are inevitable. Uh, that are, that, that are going to happen, uh, be they uh, motor vehicle crashes or natural disasters, etc. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good working uh, group of folks. Uh, this is that area of South Texas. It's 22 counties. It's about 26,000 square miles, which is as big as the state of West Virginia. Uh, and what you can see is that not every county even has a hospital. Uh, in South Texas. Uh, while the city of San Antonio is replete with hospitals, uh, you're still quite a bit away because actually where Sutherland Springs uh, sits is way down here in this little corner, uh, about an hour and a half away from San Antonio by ground. Uh, we're, we're prepared for this. We've spent a lot of time, energy, and money planning for it uh, to have uh, buses that can act as miniature hospitals uh, to respond to events uh, such as this. We practice, we drill, uh, etc. But nobody expects that on a Sunday morning you're going to have a mass shooting and have to respond. Uh, as it would turn out on that day, the American College of Surgeons was visiting our trauma center to verify whether or not we could take care of trauma patients. And so our entire faculty was present in the building uh, as, it, as it would turn out. And we had a number of residents uh, that were there with us, uh, uh, et cetera. And we even had a visitor uh, from our uh, uh, neighboring uh, Army Trauma Center across town at Brook Army Medical Center. This is the page that went out when the shooting began that notified all of us that there was something going on and that we needed to be prepared to, to, to respond to this event uh, with a potential of more than 30 patients in a mass shooting uh, headed towards San Antonio. Uh, be, in the seven minutes from the time that that shooter entered that church, um, there were 46 of the 50 people in that church shot. Uh, and there were over 200 agencies that responded to this, to, to this event uh, to, to try to make a difference. Uh, there's that Sutherland Springs, as we had uh, talked about. Uh, the closest hospital, Connolly Memorial, is a critical access 20-bed hospital that's got about four units of blood in the, in the, in the fridge, in the, in, in, in the blood bank. Uh, and so if we didn't respond to this event, you can imagine uh, what else uh, might have uh, transpired that day. Uh, overall, uh, sadly, there were only 13 patients for us to take care of uh, because the majority of those individuals were dead. They're not faceless, nameless people. So we learned a lot. How to be better prepared, how to respond. Turning those present into responders, <clears throat> which is one of the things we're gonna to do tomorrow in one of the sessions uh, in a breakout is teach people how to stop other people from bleeding to death. <clears throat> so I think the why is answered, but the how comes into question. So it's going to require dialogue from a variety of viewpoints to achieve a consensus. And if we keep the patient in the middle of that equation, that victim, 
then I think that we can do that. Again, paraphrasing something that His Grace said last night, we should have a bias for action. Uh, that we can talk a lot, but until we act, nothing's going to change. So, excluding people and excluding their ideas, excluding their dialogue is not going to help us solve this problem. At least so says the former Chief of Staff of the United States Army, Martin Dempsey. <clears throat> so, inclusiveness, if we take that in this context with this particular problem, and say that you have freedom, but you have a responsibility at the same time, that if you can have that dialogue, it should generate trust and lead to more durable solutions. So is that possible? Uh, well, we sat around, on, we had a lot of conversations about this, that uh, you know, on one side of this equation, the, 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 the general benefit of firearm uh, uh, ownership, and the negative aspects of having people have guns. Uh, but I think that there are some facts that are just written you know, out that uh, firearm ownership is a liberty. Uh, it's guaranteed by the Constitution that uh, violence is a major cause of preventable uh, death and injury. Uh, and we can reduce death and disability by working together, understanding addre and addressing the underlying problems uh, and make firearm ownership as safe as possible. So creating policies is really difficult, but that's what it's going to take uh, for us to, uh, uh, to, get past, uh, uh, to get past this. And so maybe starting with where we agree instead of where we disagree is the right way to go. So again, a number of surveys of thousands, actually, of uh, surgeons around this country uh, was undertaken. And uh, what you can see is that the majority supports some legislation to be able to address this issue. Uh, uh, while equally divided on whether or not uh, firearms are beneficial, had no bearing on the fact that legislation would be, uh, uh, would be necessary. Um, but uh, things like preventing people with serious mental illness from having a firearm uh, achieves great consensus. Uh, that increasing penalties for those doing things with firearms illegally uh, gains tremendous consensus. Uh, that enhancing a background check system uh, becomes uh, paramount. Uh, Father John, are you here? Father John Hedges, uh, he's a law enforcement uh, uh, officer. And uh, uh, what Father John will tell you is that what's lacking in the, in the national reporting system is what happens locally. And that when that police officer pulls you over for speeding, uh, they punch in your uh, license plate into their little computer, and they know every 911 call that's gone to your house from that local jurisdiction. Uh, I lived for eight years in Minnesota, and uh, in order to have to exercise my right to buy a firearm, I had to go to the local sheriff, and I had to submit uh, my background, my information, so that the local sheriff could look and see if there were any 911 calls. It doesn't have to result in a conviction, just a 911 call for domestic violence, anything like that, and I would not have permission to submit myself to a national background check. Uh, and so you had to have local law enforcement. It, it's, it, it's a fantastic system. Uh, I don't know of a Minnesotan who uh, disagrees with that system uh, because it adds a layer of safety to, to things. And we think that there's some enhancement that could be done uh, in that regard. Uh, so uh, even, even looking into uh, 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 private firearm sales, uh, we think should be accomplished. Removing firearms. Uh, I heard there was uh, some discussion last night. Uh, someone here at O'Camper had spent the last couple of days creating a safety plan uh, related to potential uh, interpersonal violence uh, in a relationship uh, related to this issue of removing firearms from someone who is a danger to themselves or to others. Um, the uh, uh, improving mental health screening and treatment 
for individuals and advocating for unrestricted, nonpartisan related research. Because if you don't understand what the problem is, if you, then you need to study it. And if you do not have funding available to be able to research this, uh, you're never going to get to the root cause of this issue. Garner's tremendous support uh, amongst this group of people who live at that cutting edge, if you will, uh, uh, pun intended for surgeons, uh, that uh, have to deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, federal database, mandatory licensing, age restrictions, uh, not, n not so much consensus on those, on those issues uh, amongst, this, uh, amongst this group. So it's a huge problem with so many uh, aspects to it. It's very complicated. Uh, and the, the difference between self-harm and interpersonal violence uh, is a stark but probably not that far uh, apart uh, uh, from, from, from each other. And we have not done ourselves any favors by politicizing this uh, and not funding research into it. So what, what, what could we do? Well, I think that if you were interested in bicycle <coughs> safety, you probably would go to bicyclists and ask them, <laughs> Uh, what can we do? How, how, how can we do this better? How can we make your, your ride safer? Uh, same here, is that uh, if you don't engage firearm owners in this discussion, and I will tell you, on, on the record, eight years ago when this first came up at the American College of Surgeons, I said, unless you engage the NRA, you are not going to come to a, you are not going to come to a solution on this problem. And I was laughed out of the room. Uh, well, in fact, Three years ago, the American College of Surgeons went and visited the NRA at their headquarters at their national meeting uh, to open this dialogue with them. And we went in that room, uh, there were preconceived notions on both parties' part about what was going to come out of this session. And interestingly, we could agree on 12 or 13 things that we thought were at issue, that we needed the NRA's help with, and that they needed our help with. Uh, and uh, uh, been some turmoil in that organization. I'm not going to get into that uh, uh, part of it. But uh, that group of folks that went to that meeting were all firearm owners uh, from the from 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 both sides of that equation, and they were really surprised uh, about our approach uh, uh, to this. This is that team. Uh, there's a number of them that have military experience. There's a number of them that have law enforcement experience. Uh, all are uh, trauma-trained uh, uh, surgeons. And this was the consensus uh, uh, document, the manuscript that we came up with. Uh, you've already seen this little uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, logo, if you will, uh, about how to work together uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. And those recommendations uh, were, as previously described, where we had achieved consensus uh, that if you're, uh, and, and, some, and some additional things, uh, that uh, uh, if you're a new gun owner, you probably should get some formal training uh, in how to handle that uh, uh, weapon so you don't shoot yourself or, or harm someone else I I I accidentally. Uh, that there probably should be required supervision uh, for, uh, you know, I grew up in a, household where there was a loaded shotgun propped up against the back door. Uh, it was sort of built in as to how you, uh, uh, how you learned how, about, about gun safety. Uh, I think we've lost some of that. Um, it's possible to develop technology so you couldn't hurt yourself with a firearm. That would be miraculous. Uh, it's not going to do away with all the firearms that already exist, uh, but it's a start towards a new future. Uh, and we have to get federally funded research opportunities to look into this problem. Uh, there are groups that uh, uh, work towards uh, uh, research and, 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 and gun safety. And if you look at the burden of disease and death, uh, only falls has a mortality 
uh, and research funding level that's below gun violence. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the, what we've done for heart disease and cancer uh, and lung disease over time, uh, mortality is decreasing because we have applied our resources to those problems. Uh, we have not for gun violence. There are research organizations around the country that stand ready to do this. Uh, we had uh, submitted a manuscript to three different organizations uh, for presentation at their, uh, at their meeting, talking about what impact uh, concealed carry permit has had on uh, um, unintentional injury over time. Uh, no one would take it. Uh, I think too politically charged uh, p potentially is how they is is how they viewed that, or that they didn't like the conclusion because the conclusion is surprisingly uh, that it hasn't changed mortality, it hasn't changed unintentional injury uh, by having a more concealed carry. We we didn't know that going into this. Uh, we just wanted to study the problem, and uh, we used a number of resources to to to, to do that, uh, but we did it for free. Uh, we did it in our own personal time. Uh, because there was no one willing to fund that. Uh, this is Dr. Ronald Stewart, uh, the medical director of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, my partner and friend. Uh, and uh, he has been to Capitol Hill on a number of occasions advocating for funding to investigate uh, uh, firearm injury and violence uh, to uh, uh, make the uh, uh, research efforts commensurate with the disease burden that this problem brings to us. There are other aspects of this, and uh, again, not a, 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 a psychologist uh, uh, by training, uh, perhaps psycho a psychologist by parenting and grandparenting, I don't know if that, uh, if that counts, um, but uh, uh, social structures that are in place in this country, not, not by design necessarily, uh, potentially put people in harm's way. And how can we work towards solutions? Uh, I have told, if not one, then probably 4,001 young men, you need to find a better pastime. You, you have to get new friends because this is going to get you killed. Uh, I would like to think that some of them heard that message, and, uh, but there are plenty of recidivists uh, that enter our uh, trauma system uh, with repeat uh, uh, injuries, and uh, some of this has to do with uh, the, how they were raised, where they live, uh, literally who they hang out with. And that combination of poverty, mental illness, substance abuse, uh, sits right in the middle of this, uh, of this lethal uh, uh, triad uh, related to individual risk factors for violence. And there's a certain potential level of hopelessness without, you know, not protecting one's self for a future life uh, that potentially uh, uh, leads one to unnecessarily put themselves uh, in harm's way. Is it possible that we could screen people for violence? We do this uh, because the Joint Commission uh, that uh, 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 accredits hospitals around this country has put in place certain things that uh, we ask people. I, I, I mean, I, I had the flu and I went to my emergency department and they asked me if I felt safe at home. Uh, yes, yes, I do. Thank you, th thank you though, for, for, for asking. Um, and uh, uh, could you, you know, put this in place in more than one, you know, it, it shouldn't just be an emergency department thing, it should be every encounter uh, with a healthcare professional uh, about how one feels in their environment and are you safe or not. Uh, I think that could go a long way. Just as we have come up with injury prevention programs uh, for falls and motor vehicles, uh, 
there should be a violence intervention program. And so uh, Rochelle Dicker and company uh, from the American College of Surgeons have put together a comprehensive program for trauma centers. It's one of the things that they will be required to adopt in this country over the next three years and there will be a, a verification uh, that they have these programs in place and are working on this. It shouldn't just be trauma centers. Uh, it should be every, every encounter you have uh, with, a, with a patient, a client, uh, uh, even in your church. It's uncomfortable to have these conversations, uh, but if we don't have them, uh, nothing is going to change. So it's not just the surgeons. Uh, in fact, after we uh, were able to achieve our own consensus, we did a little uh, outreach uh, to some other organizations. And uh, this is a group of individuals representing a number of medical organizations around this country, 47 in fact, uh, who signed off on a consensus document uh, and this is everyone from the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, through the uh, uh, Trauma Center Association of America, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the Emergency Nurse Association. Uh, so uh, people from all disciplines uh, uh, working to care for uh, our patients and prevent them from being injured. Uh, in a similar kind of a logo, uh, those 47 uh, organizations uh, supported these statements, uh, validating that in fact firearm injury is a public health crisis in this country, that the healthcare system must engage the community in addressing the social determinants of disease which contribute to this structural violence and that we needed to engage far, firearm owners and populations at risk to develop programs and policies to address this issue. Uh, so in way of, of summary, uh, I think that all of us should commit to action. Uh, that uh, we, have, we, we have a certain responsibility, that we should do our best to work together, even with life members of the NRA, uh, to address these uh, uh, issues, to reduce firearm injury and violence, and understanding violence and its determinants uh, becomes paramount. That if we could get together, if we could have communion over uh, these issues, uh, we should be able to solve this uh, problem. Uh, it's going to take a generational change and perhaps some radical change uh, to, to, to make this happen. Uh, but uh, uh, without research funding, it's, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, we have to engage uh, our constituents uh, if we're going to make a difference in this. So with that, I would like to again thank the uh, uh, Ocamper organization uh, for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions uh, that anybody has. Uh, thank you. set of questions that you um, uh, included in your presentation for screening those whose um, lives involve daily, weekly violence um, and the ubiquity of guns and violence with them. Um, if they answer yes to all those questions, or a good majority of them, what do you suggest then after that screening process, or what is the next step to engage the ED with and the trauma department with? those who respond to those? Yep, so I'm just a simple surgeon, and I'm gonna do what I do every time an injured child comes in, I'm gonna get the social worker involved uh, to come see that, but who's the social worker? 
uh, here, or a mental health uh, professional, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to get those uh, folks involved to have uh, the discussions that I'm not armed to have. Uh, I don't solve those problems for people. I'll, I'll, I'll take out your appendix. I'll, I'll operate on your stab wound. Uh, but uh, I don't know how to address your issues of safety and violence at home. Uh, the questions that we proposed, we actually said to the NRA, uh, we don't know what the questions are to ask. And we would need your help in order to come up with a set of questions that might help us to understand if someone was at risk uh, 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 f for this. And uh, there's, a, there's a group of folks that do nothing but you know, injury prevention. Uh, violence prevention is, is, is its own whole you know, uh, thing. I, I, I think we have this uh, uh, in interpersonal violence uh, related to um, uh, intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in many ways, there are uh, uh, places that people can, can go uh, to seek safety, uh, and uh, we don't have that uh, for this. We don't know what the magnitude of the, of the problem I don't know how many people are going to answer which question is positive uh, at this point because it's not been uh, in, in investigated. Uh, and so uh, I think that the solutions will come from the question and answer session. Uh, with those w with those individuals over time, uh, if anybody has answers to that, I would be delighted to hear it uh, because we could share that uh, with the rest of uh, w with the rest of the folks that are interested in this problem. Thank you. The, the, yeah, they need you to use the microphone so that. They You could use this one. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, uh, oh, okay. Now this feels. <laughs> um, I wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about the Stop the Bleed program. I know you're going to be presenting um, tomorrow, I believe, about it. And I was in D.C. last week and heard some about it. And I think it would just be really great for us all to know exactly what that program is. Sure. So the uh, Stop the Bleed program came out of uh, the Sandy Hook school shooting in uh, Connecticut. Uh, and a friend and partner of mine, Len Lenworth Jacobs, uh, and his team uh, stood at the ready as we did two years ago in San Antonio uh, to receive these casualties. And two showed up uh, because everyone else was killed. Uh, and it was at that point that uh, he said, just as an individual, I have done nothing to try to prevent this. We need to do something. Uh, and it caught the president's attention. Uh, and Dr. Jacobs made enough uh, noise about it that he was invited to the White House uh, to say, you know, what can we do about this? Uh, there were four Hartford consensus groups that, uh, that met. I was privileged to participate in consensus number three. And what came out of that was that, well, we're going to need to do something about this whole preventing this from ever happening, but what can we do in the meantime? And that goes to that one slide that I talked about, turning uh, bystanders into immediate responders. The difference between immediate responders and first responders is first responders uh, have been trained to do this, uh, and they do it as a part of their livelihood. Immediate responders is you and me. Uh, we're just there when something happens, and we can watch someone bleed to death, or we could try to do something about it. And it was uh, some fascinating discussions about how long it would take, and you know, wh where should we do this, and how would we go about it, uh, to now today, uh, the Texas legislature this past uh, summer uh, passed legislation that every school in the state of Texas has to have a stop the bleed kit and trained individuals in, in how to do it. Uh, if you look at in probably every airport, uh, you will find a stop the bleed kit which contains gauze and tourniquets and some other things. Uh, it, Stopping bleeding is actually a scouting merit badge. And it doesn't take terribly long to learn how to do it. 
Uh, so in fact, you can give somebody about a 20 minute lecture and about 20 minutes of hands-on training and they retain that knowledge for years uh, as, it would, as it would turn out. Uh, I have, uh, I presented something like this in Minnesota uh, and one of the nurses uh, who was out in Sleepy Eye, uh, Minnesota, her fourth generation farming family, uh, decided that for, for Father's Day she was going to get her dad a tourniquet to put in the combine. Little did she know within two months he needed to use it on himself. Uh, and it was uh, life-saving, game-changing uh, uh, you know, for, for those folks. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the rule of thumb uh, is, and I checked when I went in, there's a, there's a library uh, in the other building. It has a little medical kit in it. Uh, they have an AED uh, inside the bag, but they don't have a Stop the Bleed kit. So we're going to work on that. Uh, for St. Peter's, uh, for Saints Peter and Paul, uh, to help uh, get them uh, uh, outfitted with a stop the bleed kit. Uh, there are plenty of folks who bleed from causes unrelated to uh, intentional injury. Uh, you, you can fall and break your arm and uh, 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 sever a you know sever a blood vessel. Uh, anybody who knows anybody on dialysis, uh, those dialysis shunts can spontaneously rupture uh, and uh, and cause someone to bleed. It doesn't. Take Take long to bleed to death, uh, and that's and that's what's at issue uh, uh, with that turning those who are bystanders into immediate responders uh, to teach them how to stop someone from bleeding to death. As a pediatric intensivist who does the work along with our trauma surgeons, I thank you so much for this. Um, I don't own a gun, but I have friends, family, colleagues who own guns or in the NRA. And your comments about language is tremendous. In the um, pediatric world, we've been asked to ask about gun ownership or having guns in the home for a long time, and usually, if I would say, do you own a gun? You immediately believe that if you answer yes, I will have a negative impression of you. And so in pediatrics, in asking that question about guns, asking the question about vaping is not do you own or do you vape? It's how do you secure your guns? What do you vape? And then it, it takes away that negative connotation. So I think that, that that language that you talked about and all of those questions are so important because we all have biases, but in caring for our patients and interacting with each other, we have to set those aside and our language matters. The one group of victims that you didn't talk about are those of us in healthcare that are exposed to these um, tragedies that happen to people. Repeatedly. Pardon? Repeatedly. repeatedly. Yes, repeatedly. And that is exhausting and emotionally um, permanent. How do you address that? And how do we keep our dedicated health care providers in this field? to maintain their resilience so that they can continue to do the important work. So uh, one, of the th one of the slides that I did not include in this presentation uh, was a panel discussion where three uh, interpersonal violence uh, victims uh, who were survivors uh, addressed a group of healthcare providers talking about their uh, personal story uh, and how thankful they were for that. Another slide I didn't include uh, was a banner that we received from a hospital in Las Vegas uh, following the shooting talking about resiliency. You can overcome this. Uh, and so I think the combination of uh, addressing this head-on, acknowledging that it's an issue, 
uh, and giving people an opportunity to see that even though not everyone can live through this, there are some that do, and how thankful they are uh, for what we do on a daily basis, uh, that it's worth continuing uh, to, to, to persevere uh, in this. We, we have a certain skill set, a talent uh, for, for, for dealing with this. Not everyone lives. Uh, death is a part of life. And uh, the, the, the sooner we can come to grips with that, the better. Uh, the worst of the worst is to take care of a one-year-old who's been shot to death. Uh, it, it's, it, it just because all of the healthcare team has a one-year-old or they had a one-year-old not that long ago. Uh, and it really brings it home and is, is personal. It's why we rely so heavily on our chaplains. And I need to remind them on a regular and recurring basis, you're not just here for the patient, you're here for us. Uh, we, we need your help. Uh, God bless the chaplains, I don't know who there, who's there for them. Uh, maybe some of the chaplains, but uh, for, yeah. It's, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, for me, my SWAT teams are there. <laughs> As a chaplain, my, it is my SWAT teams and my wildland firefighters that for the most part I go talk to uh, other than my confessor, uh, it's not so much the many psychiatrists that I know. Uh, it is uh, those who have smelled the breath of the dragon. Um, on my badge, there is a black mourning band um, that um, indicates that the, a line of duty death of someone uh, in my knowledge around the country. And uh, over the last uh, two and a half decades, uh, it has been, just a little statistic here, it's been on there more than it's been off. And um, something's wrong with that. Um, uh, my hat is off to those of you in ERs and so forth. Uh, in the aftermath of the, the shooting in Isla Vista, uh, 23 May uh, 2014, um, I, I was on the ground that night with law enforcement. Um, and the day following debriefed with uh, both UCSB police and uh, Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department and was asked by Dr. Jason Prostowski from Cottage Hospital Santa Barbara emergency room to come debrief uh, the EMS staff. And um, uh, I have often spoken of carpal tunnel of the soul and there is a repetitive stress injury that happens to us whose little pea brains take pictures of those things and hear those sounds and have those intrusive fragments cataloged away in there. Uh, tomorrow, while you're talking about um, stopping the bleed, I will be talking about carpal tunnel of the soul and, from, uh, and things like that. And uh, uh, here again, it is peer support that is strongest, not abstractions, not concepts. It is someone who has smelled the breath of the dragon and walked away. And you can walk away and you can thrive. It is not something that's tattooed PTSD upon your forehead for the rest of your life. Otherwise, I'd have a lot of tattoos. <laughs> and thank you, doctor, for framing this as a public health question because that's exactly what it is. Thank you. Thank you. And that's from a gun owner, incidentally. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for framing the complexity of this as a public health issue. I'm curious um, if you can speak to, um, in some of the conversation that's been happening um, nationally, just sort of, if you can speak to how we might participate in that um, and just as a clinical psychologist in a primary care clinic here on the west side of Chicago, we're, we experience very high rates of violence and trauma, social determinants of health. Um, the idea of the intentional injury and violence, you know, the, the need to allocate those resources and to really commit to think tanks and, and research to understand that. I'm just curious how we can partner and support in that because in, in the world where I often am, 
it feels as though there's the stream of the NRA and those that are operating from registered gun owners and sort of gun safety and all of that. But then where is the line of those who are not registering guns and illegal gun sale and gang violence? Um, where is that voice being heard and, and shaped into the conversation? And it just strikes me the idea of isolation, that there's the multiple groups affected by intentional um, injury and violence. And just, yeah, if there's any way to speak to how we can be involved and engage and seek to promote hope as well as communion in the isolation that's, that's all even just a part of the conversation and who are the different stakeholders and who are those most vulnerable and most affected by that. So, so I think as Grace uh, addressed this uh, uh, last night in terms of uh, uh, how we have potentially isolated ourselves or allowed people to isolate themselves, uh, that you can have a voice that's anonymous uh, behind a screen and be violent, be violent in your language, be violent in your approach uh, uh, to things. Uh, Father Sean will tell you uh, that, uh, you know, having been de deployed to the combat zone, soldiers who go out on patrol all day long uh, who are shooting at people and trying to prevent from being blown up, uh, come back and play violent video games as a way of relaxing. Uh, we have uh, muted violence as a problem. Uh, and if you just look at all of the violence uh, in television shows uh, and movies, it, it, it is just an acceptable way of being. Uh, you can undo that. And the analogy that I give people is it, it's not unlike, uh, so, so drunk driving is a horrible problem in this country and people get killed and they kill other people. Uh, we solved, for the most part, a huge public health problem with smoking. Uh, and uh, in downtown Rochester, there's a restaurant called The Honker, and I use this example all the time. Uh, and uh, 20 years ago, if you walked in The Honker with a cigarette, they'd hand you an ashtray. Today, if you went in that restaurant and lit up a cigarette, the entire restaurant would turn on you. We have to make violence unacceptable. We can do that. It's going to take a generation and a concerted effort to do that. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I know that it's possible. Uh, and I think that the more that we think about it, have that dialogue uh, with, uh, uh, with people, pray about it. Uh, I think that uh, we stand a chance, potentially, of, uh, of uh, preventing unnecessary, and I think there's some necessary violence, unnecessary violence. Uh, and uh, it, what, this doesn't, what this doesn't touch on is that intentional violent death, uh, firearms are, are just about at the 50% level. Uh, the other 50% of deaths are related to other things. Violence is the common thread uh, in, in all of that. We have to make that unacceptable. Donald, thank you. You've shown us a way forward. You've told us that we've got to talk to both sides, and you've testified to the fact that these statistics have faces, and we thank you for that.